Philip K. Dick's novel, The Man in the High Castle, has a lot of references to two other books folded within to not just the background, but also in in very important ways, the plot of the novel itself. Now, one of these is the I Ching, the Chinese Book of Changes used within the Pacific states and the Rocky Mountain states. Uh, by quite a few of the characters, and we've discussed that elsewhere. Another one is a fictional book, fictional both in the sense that in the universe it is supposed to be a work of fiction, but also fictional in another sense in that this book doesn't exist anywhere in our world where Philip K. Dick was writing A Man in the High Castle. It is a made-up book within a fictional universe, which is discussing how that universe could be radically different. And so it's essentially an alternate history novel within an alternate history novel. So we get a very interesting meta level here. And as we're going to see, there's a few references where Dick might be hinting at his own authorship or making a a side joke. In this case, it is attributed to this guy who's an actual character, as we meet late in the the story, Hawthorne Abinson. And what's really key about this book, so in uh, Man in the High Castle, the Axis powers, uh, Nazi Germany, Japan, to a lesser extent, Italy, have won World War II. Uh, They eventually conquer the United States, except for the Rocky Mountain states, which are pretty helpless between the Nazi-occupied area in the east and the Pacific states of America. In this case, it's a little bit closer to our timeline in that the Axis powers are going to be defeated. Actually, the, the USSR, which will fight with the Allies, will also be defeated. And the main winners are Britain and the United States of America. And in the end, we're going to see that they're going to be at each other's throats as well. So it's not quite our own history, although it's a little bit closer to our own history in certain respects. But as we're also going to see, the ultimate, um, let's call it at the time, resolution will be closer to the resolution in Man in the High Castle, the world that is developed there. So there's four main groups of people or individuals who are going to be discussing this book, besides, of course, towards the end, Juliana and Abinson, which we're going to talk about later because there's an important wrinkle that comes up there that we don't want to discuss right now. We're we're looking at what people make of this book and what the book actually tells us. So in Chapter 5, we have uh, Wyndham Matson and his... Um, you know, side piece, Rita, he's cheating on his wife with, with her. And she notices a book on his shelf and says, hey, did you ever read this book? So that's where we pick up. He says, no, I never read it. My wife got that. She reads a lot. And Rita says, well, you should read it. So he picks it up and he, and he says, isn't that one of those banned in Boston books? And she says, banned through the United States and in Europe, of course. And he says, well, I've heard of this Hawthorne Abinson, but actually he had not. All he could recall about the book was what? That it was very popular right now, another fad, another mass craze. And he says, I don't have time to read popular fiction. I'm too busy with work. Secretaries, he thought acidly, read that junk at home alone in bed at night. It stimulates them instead of the real thing. And he says, one of those love stories. And she says, no, no, it's a story about war. Uh, and uh, she goes on, and uh, as they're driving through traffic, she says, Abinson's theory is that Roosevelt would have been a terribly strong president, as strong as Lincoln. He showed it in the year he was president, all those measures he introduced. The book is fiction. I mean, it's in novel form. Roosevelt isn't assassinated in Miami he goes on and is reelected in 1936, so he's president until 1940, until during the war. He's still president when Germany attacks England and France and Poland, and he sees all of that, 
he makes America strong. Garner, so we're talking about in, in the universe, <clears throat> was a really awful president. A lot of what happened was his fault. And then instead of in 1940, instead of Bricker, a Democrat would have been elected. And so she goes on and she says, his theory is instead of an isolationist like Bricker, in 1940, <clears throat> after Roosevelt, Rexford Tugwell would have been president. And so now we've got an imaginary character because we don't have Tugwell in our world. He would have been very active in continuing the Roosevelt anti-Nazi policy. So Germany would have been afraid to come to Japan's help in 1941. They wouldn't have honored the treaty. And so Germany and Japan would have lost the war. And then he's very skeptical of this um, as a you know, businessman and man of the world. And he says... Um, it's not funny, uh, you know, this, this wouldn't have happened. And <clears throat> he says, well, how, how would this? And she says, it's in fiction form. Naturally, it's got a lot of fictional parts. It's got to be entertaining or people wouldn't read it. But there's like an entire plan about how the U.S. fleet is not destroyed at Pearl Harbor and then Japan is defeated afterwards. And interestingly, what we see uh, Wyndham Matson doing each time is saying, oh, no, that's not going to happen. So he's skeptical about the possibilities. And, you know, he talks about Rommel, for example. And he says, no strategy on earth could have defeated Erwin Rommel. No events like this guy dreamed up this town in Russia very heroically called Stalingrad. No holding action could have done any more than delay the outcome. It couldn't have changed it. Listen, I met Rommel. What a man, what dignity and bearing. So I know what I'm talking about. So he's, he's the kind of person who can't see the world as having turned out very differently, right? And uh, what, what else we find out about this quite interestingly? Wyndham Matson says that, or actually it's not Wyndham Matson, it's, it's a, a, um, Rita. And she says, it's okay to talk about this. The Japs have let it be circulated in the Pacific. I read a lot of them are reading it. It's popular in the home islands. It stirred up a lot of talk. So within the, the Japanese occupied Pacific states of America, within the co-prosperity sphere, even in the home islands, Japanese people and everybody else who's in their, their group are okay with these matters being discussed. It's forbidden once you go into the Nazi Reich. So the next thing we need to look at, uh, and this spans several different chapters, is Joe, uh, who's actually going to turn out to be uh, something quite different than he pretends to be, and Juliana, who will figure that out, talking about this book. And Joe is actually setting a kind of trap, in a way, a trap through seduction. And so um, he's talking about the book. He says, you know what somebody says, this man, this very funny, sit down. I want, you to read, I, I, I want to read you, suppose they had won. What would it be like? We, we don't have to worry. This man has done all the thinking for us. Opening the book, Joe began turning pages slowly. The British Empire would control all of Europe, all the Mediterranean, no Italy at all, no Germany either. Bobbies and those funny little soldiers in tall fur hats and the king as far as the Volga. Juliana says, well, would that be so bad? And he says, you read the book? And she says, no, uh, but Frank and I, my former husband and I often talked about how it would have been if the Allies had actually won the war. And Joe goes on and he says, do you know how it is that England wins, beats the Axis? She shakes her head, and Joe says, he has Italy betray the Axis. Italy goes over to the Allies, joins the Anglo-Saxons, and opens up what he calls the soft underbelly of Europe. But that's natural for him to think that. We all know the cowardly Italian army that ran every time they saw the British drinking vino. So he's sort of, you know, uh, talking about his own, his own uh, ostensible group in very bitter terms. And then he, he uh, goes on as well and starts, you know, reading parts of the book to her. And this is going to get taken up again. Um, later on, she'll be reading passages from that. But first, we want to talk about this idea of visiting Abinson. 
So they're in the, the uh, Rocky Mountain states and not that far away. And they're talking about the book again. And uh, they're talking about Abinson. He's an ex-serviceman. He was in the U.S. Marine Corps in World War II, wounded in England by a Nazi Tiger tank, a sergeant. It says he's practically got a fortress. He writes in guns all over the place. And it doesn't say so here, but I heard someone say he's almost sort of paranoid, charged barbed wire around the place, and it's set in the mountains, hard to get to. So this is the high castle, right, that's being discussed. That's his pet name for this compound. And so Joe says, then they won't get him. He's on the lookout, smart. And Juliana says, I believe he's got a lot of courage to write that book. If the Axis had lost the war, we'd be able to say and write anything we wanted like we used to. We'd be one country and we'd have a fair legal system, the same one for all of us. And, um, you know, she says, I don't understand you, Joe. What do you believe? What is it you want? You defend those monsters, those freaks who slaughtered the Jews. And then you, and then uh, Joe says, let me finish this meal you fixed for me. And, um, you know, she can tell there's something going on, something happening, something terrible is happening, she thought, coming out of him, and I seem to be helping it. And he is actually going to go on to suggest that that's something, as we're going to see in chapter 10, right? He goes, he, they're talking again about the uh, uh, possible uh, past and uh, their, their present. And he says, you, you take to that grasshopper book so much. I wonder, do you suppose a man who writes a bestseller, an author like that, Abinson, do people write letters to him? I bet lots of people praise his book by letters to him, maybe even visit. All at once she understood, Joe, it's only another hundred miles. His eyes shone. She, he smiled at her, happy again, no longer flushed or troubled. We could, she said. You drive so good. It'd be nothing to go on up there, would it? S slowly, Joe said, well, I doubt a famous man lets visitors drop in, probably so many of them. And she says, why not try, Joe? All he could do is send us away, please. And so he says, well, you know, we'll have to get prepared, new clothes, haircut, all those sorts of things. And then we'll go and visit this guy. Now, this is actually laying a plot, uh, which we're going to see discussed a little bit later with, with somebody else. But first, we need to go back to chapter 7 and look at what is being discussed there. I do want to point out one other thing, though, before we move on about Joe. So he, in fact, is going to say that the New Deal that's being presented there, which extends not just to the United States, but gets extended to the rest of the world, China, for example, is actually taking what was great about uh, the fascist and uh, Nazi approach and sort of taking credit for it, but then leaving out the bad stuff like concentration camps and the you know extermination and all that. And uh, you know he's making quite an interesting point there from his his perspective, as we'll find out. Anyway, back to chapter seven with Children. So he is at the home of the Kasoras, this very you know elite, young, progressive. Japanese couple that have been stationed in the Pacific States of America, and they begin to talk about this, this work, right? So he says, uh, I see you're reading The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. I hear it on many lips, but pressure of business prevents my own attention. And he, he uh, looks at them and says, a mystery? Excuse my abysmal ignorance. Now here's where we get something really interesting. So Paul says, not a mystery, on contrary, interesting form of fiction, possibly within genre of science fiction. And then Betty says, oh, no, no science in it, nor, not set in future. Science fiction deals with future, in particular future where science has advanced over now. Book fits neither premise. And then Paul says, it deals with an alternate present. Many known science fiction novels of that sort. To Robert, he explained, pardon my insistence in this, but as my wife knows, I was for a long time a science fiction enthusiast. I began that hobby early in my life. I was merely 12. It was during the early days of the war. And then Paul extends an invitation to him, which is really quite you know, momentous. Uh, 
Care to borrow Grasshopper? Paul asked. We will soon be through, no doubt within a day or so, my office being downtown, not far from your esteemed store. I could happily drop it off at lunchtime. He was silent and then possibly, chilled in thought due to a signal from Betty, continued, you and I, Robert, could eat lunch together on that occasion. And this is like a very big thing, right? Um, And then they start to get into discussion about American cultural forms and jazz music and then the alternate history that the book describes. Betty, after a moment, said, one in which Germany and Japan lost the war. And then a little bit later, Robert says, I would like to know what he supposes it would be like in a world where Germany or in Japan lost the war. And Paul says, very complicated differences. Better to read the book. It would spoil it for you possibly to hear. And then Robert says, I have, I have strong convictions on the subject. I have frequently thought it over. The world would be much worse. So isn't this interesting? We have, you know, uh, Frank and Juliana have thought this over. Wyndham, uh, um, uh, you know, Matson doesn't want to think it over. Rita thinks it's kind of interesting. Uh, Children has thought it over, but he's come to a different conclusion. It's a good thing that the Nazis and the Japanese won the war, not the Americans and British. In his view, the Soviets would have taken over the world in that case, right? But uh, it's very interesting to see that this is discussed as science fiction, and there's a case being made for alternate history falling within Science fiction, <laughs> isn't, isn't it? So then we, we can go on, and there's another uh, very interesting discussion happening in chapter 8. And here it's not between people. It's just one person reading it to himself, the Reich's Council Rice, who has got some tension with the SD people. And he's trying to read the book to himself, and he finds that he's moved by the passage discussing the fall of Berlin uh, and the death of Adolf Hitler. And so, you know, it says, his eyes fell on a scene involving Hitler. He found himself unable to stop. He began to read the scene out of sequence, the back of his neck burning. The trial of Hitler after the close of the war. Hitler in the hands of the Allies. Good God. Also Goebbels, Goering, all the rest of them at Munich. And, um, you know, they go on. He gets interrupted a few more times. And then we read something very interesting. Rice shut, shut the book and sat for a time. In spite of himself, he was upset. More pressure ought to have been put on the Japanese to suppress this damn book. In fact, it's obviously deliberate on their part. They could have arrested this, whatever his name is, Abinson. They have plenty of power in the Middle West. What upset him was this, the death of Adolf Hitler, the defeat and destruction of Hitler, the part A in Germany itself, as depicted in Abinson's book. Now, notice what he's going to say here. It was all somehow grander, more in the old spirit than the actual world, the world of German hegemony. So this really upsets him. And he's thinking, is this just this man's writing ability? You know, he's, he's sort of like Goebbels, writing fiction. Look how he plays on sentiments. Um, maybe, and then he says, maybe this Abinson is a Jew writing in the last outpost of the former plutocratic U.S. publishing industry once located in downtown New York and supported by Jewish and communist gold. They're still at it, he thinks, trying to poison us. And he says, this Judish's book, right, a Jewish book itself, um, maybe somebody should go and pay this person a visit and take care of him, right? We should send commandos in. And interestingly, going back to this, the world is grander in the book than it is in real life of his time, he decides to himself, you know, I wish this was over. Does it have to go on forever? The war ended years ago. We thought it was finished then, you know. Um, I have my routine duties. I don't have time for any of these harebrained adventures, sending Einsatz commandos after Abinson. My hands are full greeting German sailors and answering coded radiograms. Let somebody higher up initiate a project of that sort. So he considers it, and then he decides not to do it. Meanwhile, there is actually a plot by the SD to go and kill Abinson. And we finish up in 
chapter 15 with one more interesting thing being noted about the book. Now, this is by Julianne. This is after she finds out that Joe is dead and she's deciding to go and uh, uh, visit the, the Obinsons. She reads the book uh, at 6.15 in the evening. She finished it. I wonder if Joe got to the end of it, she wondered. There's so much more in it than he understood. What is it Obinson wanted to say? Nothing about his make-believe world. Am I the only one who knows? I bet I am. Nobody else really understands Grasshopper but me. They just imagine they do. Now, what exactly it is that she is thinking that she knows more about the book, we'll get to that elsewhere, but it is important that there's sort of a, a crack opening up. It's not just an alternate history. There's something else going on with this work. And we see that people can have so many different reactions to it. Um, it is, in some respects, you know, a object of derision and skepticism, uh, an object of hatred, but also an object of speculation and perhaps even freedom and hope. So, very important imaginary uh, alternate history novel within the scope of this great alternate history novel by Philip K. Dick. Uh, 